Unfortunately, we did not record the audio for the first section of this video, so I will be reading from a script to attempt to replace the audio. I will not replace the singing. Please excuse the lack of synchronization, mispronunciation, and missing pieces. Welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. I am Emily Newman, and my pronouns are she and her. Today, I and Peggy Getz will be your officiants. WES is one community unified across time and space, gathering for these Sunday platforms to affirm our values and commit to a better world. Welcome to those of you here in the hall, watching on Zoom and catching the recording later. If you are on Zoom, please check the chat for a welcome and various tips from Joe Klein, today's Zoom chat usher. If you are here in the hall and would like an assistive listening device, please ask the sound team at the back. A special welcome to our visitors today. We'd love to get to know you and answer any questions you have. To get on our email list, you can fill out the connection form at tinycc slash westconnects or select send an email to wes at ethicalsociety.org. And if you're here in person, we invite you to stop by the welcome table after platform for a pink welcome form and or just chat up anyone with one of these white name badges. Let's check the Zoom chat to see who's attending remotely this morning. Linda Silversmith says, hi, think about joining the West Earth Ethics Action Team. You can get information for the Earth Ethics Action Team and the Global Connections Team at the West website, ethicalsociety.org. Go to Connection and click on Small Groups, then scroll down to the selection for the appropriate team. Gabriel Santa Maria says, good morning, everyone. Happy to see every happy to be able to join this Sunday morning and support these authors and global connections. Patty and Paul Absher say good morning. Patty is under the weather and regrets not being there in person. Laura Desculio, Calma Trixie, and Trish Weil say good morning. They are eager to hear the platform. It is good to connect and share this time together. Our opening words this morning are by Aurora Levis Morales from her book, Medicine Stories, History, Culture, and the Politics of Integrity. Solidarity is not a matter of altruism. Solidarity comes from the inability to tolerate the affront to our own integrity, of passive or active collaboration in the oppression of others, and from the deep recognition that, like it or not, our liberation is bound up with that of every other being on the planet, and that politically, spiritually, in our heart of hearts, we know anything else is unaffordable. Our music today is being provided by our friend Lilo Gonzalez. As a singer, songwriter, and teacher, Lilo uses music to build community and fight for justice. Today's opening song is No Human Being is Illegal. Salvador, 
bonita es mi tierra, te lo digo, compañero. Ay, qué bonita es mi tierra, que lo sepa el mundo entero. Ay, qué bonita es mi tierra, te lo digo, compañero. Ay, qué bonita es mi tierra, que lo sepa el mundo entero. No puedo vivir aquí, no puedo vivir allá, señores, cuando tendré. No que una Venezuela, te lo digo, compañero. No que una Venezuela, que lo sepa el mundo entero. ¿Cómo está? No que una Venezuela, te lo digo, compañero. No que una Venezuela, que lo sepa el mundo entero. Each week, we read our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. If you are interested in taking a turn to read the statement of purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc forward slash R-E-A-D-S-O-P. You can read it here in person or make a recording that will be in included in a future platform. Today's reader is Susan Runner. Where is she? There she is. Um, as an active West member for 22 years, Susan has served on a variety of committees and teams, including the West Board. For over two decades, she's generously shared her time and talent here at West and in El Rodeo, our sister community in El Salvador. Thank you, Peggy. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit. With faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capacities. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of reverence and responsibility for each other and the earth. We warmly invite you to join our community of children and adults as we work for a world where love and justice cross all borders. Thank you, Susan. As Susan lights our community candle, I invite everyone to join in our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. Let us now enter into the centering time of our platform. Each week, we ring this chime in solidarity with people around the world. Today, I am particularly mindful of the Santa Marta Five, the five Salvadoran environmentalists who were arrested in January under bogus charges, incarcerated for seven months under harsh, inhumane conditions, and now remain under house arrest. One of the five is Antonio Pacheco, director of the Salvadoran NGO known as ADAS. Antonio is a tireless leader of community development, and in that role, he's been an instrumental guide, illuminating how West could most strategically support our sister, our sister communities' development projects. Today, we hold in our hearts the Santa Marta's five, 
and the countless environmental warriors engaging in the struggle around the globe. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us. Let us open our hearts to compassion for those who suffer. And let us commit ourselves to the work that calls for our love. As we move into our meditation, take a moment to relax. Relax into your body and find a comfortable, upright position in your chair. Close your eyes if you wish, or keep your eyes open, directing your gaze slightly downward. Relax and soften the muscles in your face, then your shoulders, your hands, and your belly. Focus on your breath, rhythmically breathing in and out, filling your lungs slowly, then emptying them. Focusing on your breath, breathing in and out, filling your lungs, then slowly emptying them, saying to yourself, breathing in my breath grows deep, breathing out my breath goes slowly. We continue our meditation in silence and in the music that follows. tell you that this was written by Victor Hara in 1969 and it's called The Right to Live in Peace, El Derecho de Vivir en Paz. And he dedicated a song to the Vietnamese people. Uh, he was killed. Uh, we just went to Vietnam this year and I was asking if he went to to Vietnam, but he, he didn't go, you know, but again, he can feel the pain, like many of you at a time, with so many brothers and sisters, and still now, you know, what's going on in the Middle East. So let's think about this song. Let's think about Victor Hara. Oh, yeah. 
Today's reading is by Frederick Douglass from his West India Emancipation speech given on August 4th, 1857. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did. It never will. Our platform speakers today are Robin Broad and John Cavana. Among the many things that each of them has accomplished in their lives, Robin is a research professor at American University and John is a longtime director, now senior advisor at the Institute for Policy Studies. Together, they have been involved, they've been involved in Salvadoran gold mining struggle since 2009, helped build a network of international allies, of which Wes is a member, and co-authored the award-winning Page Turner book, The Water Defenders, truly, it's hard to put down once you start. The Water Defenders, How Ordinary People Saved a Country from Corporate Greed. It is with deep gratitude and solidarity that we welcome Robin and John here today.
podium setups. <laughs> and of course, we return that deep gratitude. Um, it's an honor to be with you all this morning on Human Rights Day. Special thanks to Peggy, to Ross, to Emily, to the tech team, and every, oh, Lilo, although you probably would rather have him keep singing than listen to me. Um, um, and anyone else who put in extra efforts to put this event together. John and I were told that the topic we were speaking on is water and human rights, a fitting topic for Human Rights Day. Um, and we are both deeply humbled by you all at the Washington Ethical Society and the selfless and generous support you have given to El Rodeo El Salvador over the years. Um, and I can't see those screens, but um, there should be three different photos that are showing. We wanted to, we're delighted to have you here, but we also wanted to bring in people from El Salvador. So what you should be seeing is an, a photo of an audience listening to us and others in El Salvador. It looks like there's only men in that picture, but they're not. It's just the way I took the picture. It's my fault. Um, you also should be seeing the two of us with West friends in, in El Salvador, Vidalina, Manuel, Jaime, and others, I think most of whom have spoken here. Um, and then the final photo is a picture of Salvadoran legislators, congressional people, who John will talk about more. So that's just to make us real in terms of where we are. As John and I planned for today, we decided that the best way to do our small part in today's ceremony events was to introduce these issues first by getting you into the story, much the same way as we got into it in 2009, then to pull out some of the major themes, lessons, and questions that we found ourselves truly grappling with as we worked with international allies and wrote and reconstructed the events, and of course, leaving lots of time for your reflections. So to begin, as what do you mean? I have a brand new iPhone. <laughs> to begin, as, as we began in 2009, I'm going to read for about 10 minutes from the introduction to our book, The Water Defenders. For nearly two weeks, Marcelo Rivera's family could not find him. Then, on June 29, 2009, they received a phone call they had been dreading. The anonymous caller was brief. There was a body in an old abandoned well just west of the Rivera hometown of San Isidro Cabanas. The well was near the spot where Marcelo had last been seen some 12 days earlier getting off the bus at a turnaround to the capital city. During those 12 days, Marcelo's family and friends had been at wit's end, searching frantically, desperately for him. They had spread the news of his disappearance in all barrios of San Isidro and nearby town. They had called the police for over a week to no avail. The Rivera family had even filed a formal complaint with the country's attorney general, pleading for him to conduct a search and an investigation into Marcelo's disappearance. But another poor person gone missing up in the rural north meant little to the authorities. After the anonymous tip to Marcelo's family, the police finally acted. They pulled the remains of a body out of the dry 30 meter deep well. So extensive was the torture that the body was unrecognizable. The face was grotesquely disfigured. No jaw, no lips, no nose. The fingernails had been ripped off. The testicles bound. The trachea had been broken with a nylon cord. In the ass assessment of the coroner, the death had been caused by asphyxiation. The public prosecutor disagreed concluding that the death had come from the blows to the head by a hammer. Thus, 
Marcelo Rivera became the first of several water defenders to be assassinated in the 21st century fight over mining in northern El Salvador. Though we had never met Marcelo, we have been haunted by him and the circumstances of his death ever since. Who killed Marcelo and why? Perhaps you know the difference between a pupusa and a tortilla, or perhaps, like we had done, you are entering the story without a clue. Perhaps El Salvador is not even on your radar screen, or perhaps El Salvador is on your radar screen only because of the gangs or immigrants who trek north. But really, that does not matter. Certainly, on one level, this is a story about El Salvador. At the same time, it is not just about El Salvador. This is a David versus Goliath story about a battle between a country and a foreign mining company. But it is also about how global corporations, be they big gold or big pharma or big tobacco or big oil or big banks, move into poorer communities in countries all over the world. Marcelo's story, before and after his death, is about the struggle for clean and affordable water everywhere. It is also a story about workers and communities defending their ear and land, their health and their climate, <coughs> and their rights to defend themselves against corporate incursion, about how to prioritize the rights and common good versus the usual prioritization of the profits of big corporations and their owners. It is certainly a story about gold and when and why we should leave it in the ground, but it could also be about coal or natural gas or other fossil fuels, about whether we measure progress in aggregate financial terms or through the well-being of all people and the planet, and about who gets to make the decision that affect our and their lives. To say that this story of the water defenders versus big golds holds keys to reversing the outside power, oversized power of global corporations today is not an exaggeration. You may find yourself surprised by the relevance of the strategies of the water defenders in El Salvador, whether your focus is on a Walmart in Washington, D.C., a fracking company trying to expand in Texas or Pennsylvania or Maryland, or petrochemical companies outside New Orleans. Along the way, however cliched the quote attributed to Margaret Mead may have become, you may also find yourself inspired by a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens who stand up to corporate power. We first heard of Marcelo in May 2009, just a month before his murder. He was a 37-year-old teacher who directed his hometown's cultural center, an avid reader, a person who loved theater and the arts, and a good practical joke. We heard his name because he was the leader of the main coalition of Salvadoran groups opposed to mining, the National Roundtable on Mining in El Salvador, La Mesa. The round table was not well known outside of El Salvador, but we learned of it because the group had been chosen to receive a prestigious human rights award from the Institute for Policy Studies, where John works. In 2009, the Institute had selected La Mesa to honor its opposition to mining companies eager to exploit the gold deposits near El Salvador's major river. On a misty night in 2009, some of you were there, just months after Marcelo's body was pulled from the well, hundreds gathered at the National Press Club in downtown Washington, D.C. to meet and applaud the Salvadoran water defenders. Among them was Marcelo's youngest brother and best friend, Miguel. Miguel had come in his brother's place. Grief marked his face. Accepting the award on behalf of Miguel and three other La Mesa members was a peasant and community leader from the heart of Gola country, Vidalina Morales. She at first appeared hesitant, nervous before the large audience, fragile even, but then she began to speak. Her voice filled the auditorium, almost as though she did, need not, did not need the microphone. For nearly 20 minutes, she, Vidalina held the crowd spellbound as she relayed the saga of El Salvador's water defenders standing up to big gold. 
The Lempa River, she explained, winds through the country like a snake, providing water for over half the population. Water for drinking, for fishing, for farming. Water for the cities, as well as the rural areas. But the project of the Canadian headquarters Pacific Rim Mining Company at its proposed El Dorado site in Miguel and Marcelo's hometown posed serious threats to the Lempa River. Key among the dangers was the toxic cyanide that Pacific Rim would use to separate the gold from the rock. Vidalina ended her acceptance speech that night with a seemingly audacious demand that the government of El Salvador stand up to giant mining firms and choose water over gold by banning the mining, the mining of all metals. All metals. Before this, Vidalina had urged the audience to follow a related legal thriller unfolding four blocks to the west of where we sat just past the White House to the site of a little-known tribunal at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. There, as Vidalina explained, Pac Rim had filed a lawsuit against the government of El Salvador just before Marcelo's murder. The mining company claimed that El Salvador had to either allow it to mine or to pay the company over $300 million in costs and foregone profits from future mining. Vitalina invoked the upside-down world summoned by Uruguayan writer Eduardo Guiliano in asking why it was not El Salvador suing Pacrim since the mining company threatened the water and well-being of her country. But that upside-down world is the reality of giant corporate power and economic rules that affect people around the world. And as John and I think back to that evening, we must confess that we each, separately and sound, silently, found it at just as far-fetching to imagine a, a national legislature passing a law to end mining as it was to conceive of this World Bank tribunal siding with Vidalina and the rest of the water defenders. At the reception following the awards ceremony, we huddled with Miguel's, we huddled with Marcelo's brother Miguel. Miguel was soft-spoken and gentle in his manner, understandably a bit shy as he asked for help. After all, we had just met. He seemed both incredibly focused on the details of what to do next, and at the same time, shell-shocked by the chain of events by his brother's murder, and by the lawsuit. But Miguel's appeal was urgent, direct, and heartfelt. We don't know this World Bank Tribunal or how it works. We don't know what to expect. Can you help us find this lawsuit? We knew we could not say no to Miguel. But on that misty evening in October 2009, who could have guessed that Miguel's questions and Vidalina's call to action would pull us two and thousands of others around the room, including many of you in the audience, into the vortex of three un intertwined unknowns for nearly a decade to come. First, there was the on-the-ground mystery. Who killed Marcelo and why? Not just who carried out the brutal murder, but who was the mastermind? Second, there was the mystery at the national level. Could El Salvador possibly become the first nation on earth to ban mining, or at least move somewhat in that direction? And finally, the global legal thriller. Could small El Salvador possibly prevail against the global mining industry in Washington, D.C. at the World Bank? We, too, had no idea how these mysteries would play out. But as we joined the hundreds of people who streamed out of the National Press Club after the award ceremony, we knew we were hooked. Now let me turn this over to John, who's going to share some of our collaborative reflections on some of the big lessons that this work and reconstructing the events in this book have raised for us, bringing us up to the current period, and then we will be quiet so that we can learn and listen, we can listen and learn from you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Robin, and to all of you, to Lilo, to many friends who are here tonight. Um, we 
Robin and I are here in part to celebrate all of you and to celebrate Wes for your accompany, accompaniment of the communities in El Salvador uh, in their tireless work to protect water and to protect their rivers from the toxic pollution of mining. And I also just want to say personally, from my vantage point, I've worked for 40 years at the Institute for Policy Studies. A lot of it, uh, 34 of those years, with the dad of our amazing congressman just to the northwest, uh, northeast of us here, Jamie Raskin. Uh, Mark Raskin was the co-founder of IPS. And over the, the years, we've had many wonderful collaborations with all of you. So thank you on that. Um, what I'm going to do, as, as Robin said, is share a few words from, from really from both of us on the role. It's picking up where Peggy started on the role that international solidarity can play and did play in this struggle, including, I want to tell you a little bit, many of you were involved of it, some of you weren't, but the critical role that Wes played. And I'm going to end by inviting you uh, for those of you who are free on January 10th of 2024 at 4 p.m. to join us three miles south on beautiful 16th Street in front of the Salvadoran Embassy. Um, let me pause just for a second because Robin alluded this, but just saying how beautiful it is to join you on this particular day, which is the annual celebration of human rights around the world, it's the 75th anniversary of one of the greatest global documents of all time, the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And so I want to propose a toast to Eleanor Roosevelt at this moment, who championed the document and played such a key role in its creation and passage in 1948. So those of you who are joining us online with coffee, go Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm, you, some of you know that history. I'm not going to digress into it, but just to say there have been a ton of advances in the struggle for international human rights since then. And I do want to mention just one that was the result of a huge amount of struggle of groups and communities around the world which was that 13 years ago, the United Nations General Assembly recognized the human right to water and sanitation. Uh, and it led to a lot of, of wonderful activities around the world um, right up till this time. OK, now, uh, qu uh, quickly, I want to start by just saying a word about the three mysteries where Robin ended, because some of you don't know how this, how this laid out. On the first one, Yes, in March 2017, El Salvador became the first nation on earth to ban all metals mining to save its rivers. It did so in a deeply divided country and legislature through a unanimous vote of 70 to zero. <laughs> all political parties, amazing. Two. Six months earlier, in October 2016, that secretive World Bank tribunal that Robin mentioned voted unanimously, unanimously, against the mining company that sued El Salvador. Also amazing. It is in the third mystery that we don't have as good news. Who killed, who ordered the killing of Marcelo Rivera? And here we are 14 years later, and we still don't know what in Latin America they would call the intellectual authors of that, who ordered the murder, although there are many um, strong indications of, of where that might go. Okay, so I want to mention four key moments in the fighting for and winning this human right to water. And I love the quote from Frederick Douglass uh, about struggle. So think about that as you hear these. Uh, and West members have been involved in all of them. And if you have not already, you might put up that first photo deck because you're going to see um, you're going to see some photos of some of this. So the first one in 2016, the big win against this secretive tribunal at the World Bank. I just want to say that Wes was a key part of this fight. Part of what we did was simply to expose to the world what this tribunal was all about. It's one of the least just uh, legal for formations in the world. So we did a huge amount of, of writing about that. 
we did a lot of protesting outside the World Bank. Um, and it's interesting, this is an institution, I, I know many of you know of it, but it's one of the biggest employers in Washington. Over 18,000 people work for the World Bank around the world, the majority of them here. And so I just want to mention one other of the pieces of this. There are photos of uh, the protests there. But a great idea that um, the early risers among you joined in on many days leading up to 2016, this was an idea from Ron Carver, who's a great labor organizer down here in the front row. But we went uh, at eight in the morning. So of those 10, roughly 10,000 people who work in this giant city block downtown, uh, most of them enter the building, we figured out, between 8 and 9 a.m. So we went down several times early in the morning. You all helped make signs. I mean, this was one of the signs that we used uh, at the protests and in the leafleting. Uh, and we passed out leaflets, short leaflets with a graphic that explained what was going on and explained to these people walking into the building, many of whom are good people and ethical people, about this deeply unethical thing that was going on in their building. Um, and I just want to say you, you, you get prizes for better than my fellow people at the Institute for Policy Studies for being early risers uh, and great poster makers. I mean, this is a professional uh, piece here, but you also are great at making posters. So that's the first one. Second, the win in 2017, this, this historic vote. I mean, imagine this is is if Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer got together and voted on something, not just like the naming of a post office, but on something truly monumental for the United States and came together and got all of their members to vote with them. We've spent, the book gets a lot into what the people on the ground did. So the 90% of the victory is their smarts, 10% of it was the international solidarity. But just to mention a couple of things. First, amazing grassroots organizations on the ground. Peggy referred to this association of economic and social development led by one of the arrested friends, Antonio Pacheco. They led an amazing effort of mobilization. Key to it, and many of you I know have been involved in community struggles, but was Terrific education done by people. Most people there had no idea whether mining was good or bad. They had no idea that it used cyanide. Uh, it, they had no idea um, the horrible effects it could have on rivers and on land. They went to Honduras to mines. They went to eastern El Salvador to mines. They educated themselves. They educated their communities. Uh, and they did it brilliantly. And you can't win a fight without that. Second one, which maybe sounds obvious, this sounds like a fight against mining, and it is, they framed the entire fight in terms of the fight for water. Their slogans were, water is life. We can live without gold, but we can't live without water. And um, I think Robin, in the first part, when Robin was speaking, one of those three photos is very, uh, you know, well-dressed people <laughs> holding big signs that say in Spanish, water is life. Those were legislators who had just walked out of the assembly when they had the historic vote in 2017. And all of their campaign was pro-water, was water is life. Turns out very few people are opposed to water. Uh, <laughs> you learned in this. Um, and then finally, brilliant work in building a set of allies both the likely ones and the unlikely ones. You are among the likely ones. They turn to uh, people in the faith community, people in the environmental community, people in the labor community. But I really want to applaud our allies in El Salvador for realizing, just like in the US, you're not going to win anything unless you can reach un unlikely allies, reach across the aisle. And they did this by reaching out to, for example, an extremely conservative Opus Dei Archbishop of El Salvador, who it turned out was a chemist and knew the horrible impacts that cyanide would have on water and land. It included reaching out to a conservative minister of the environment who had been part of the death squad governments of El Salvador during the Civil War, who it turns out actually care, cared about the law. 
It included um, an action that Robin played a key role in of bringing a governor from halfway around the world, from the Philippines, whose community, uh, whose province had been devastated by a mine of the same mining company. So really want to salute them and, um, and salute you all, though, for the 10% of this fight that was outside pressure by international allies in research and protest uh, and in other activities hand in hand with Salvadorans. So that's the second moment I just want to mention. The third I won't get into, but it's the one that you all created. I was just in El Salvador last month on a delegation with Ross Wells from West and others from the United Church of Canada and elsewhere. Um, and I uh, forced Ross, <laughs> sitting in the Salvadoran airport for three hours, to tell me the whole story of your work with this community of El Rodeo. And I simply want to say, the rest of the struggle we describe in the book is about a fight to change a law, a mining ban in El Salvador, a, change, a fight to change unjust economic rules, this tribunal at the World Bank. All of these are critical to the right to water. But the right to water means something to ordinary people when you bring it into their homes. So the community you picked in 2009, the remarkable work you did to build a plan with them that got to their needs to have water. We visited Vitalina before. Her house is up on a hill up above a river. People carried water up every day. The things we take for granted, they didn't have there. You worked with them to conceptualize a water system. You worked with Antonio Pacheco, uh, the beautiful uh, leader of the water defenders, to design a system. You worked it through. You figured out how to finance it. It's, it's as gripping a story as the one we tell in The Water Defenders, and I just want to salute you with the way you did it. And I'm sitting here looking at you, I'm thinking of the 18,000 people at the World Bank, how they do their projects, top down, uh, encumbering people with loans they can't repay, and I think about how you did this project. And they should be coming here to be schooled in how to do their work uh, in fighting poverty by all of you. Okay, finally, fourth moment. Yeah, so just to, applause to all of you. Um, Robin and I have learned a lot about how to do good work. We've spent a lot of our lives in the Philippines and now in El Salvador, but we've learned a huge amount from you. So finally, I just want to say the fourth moment is the moment now that leads to the invitation to you which is, um, Peggy mentioned this, um, the arrest of our friends. Just a little bit of background on this. So 2019, El Salvador had national elections. The two main parties who've ruled the country since the Civil War put up boring <laughs> sort of old candidates uh, that were not inspiring. And a third candidate emerged. Uh, young, in his 30s, very hip. Um, he now calls himself the coolest dictator in the world, a guy named Naib Bukele, um, and he won. Um, used social media brilliantly, came into office in 2019, quickly embraced our then uh, president, Donald Trump. That gave us a notion we might not be in for a good ride. And he consolidated power by getting the country to vote his party a supermajority in the legislature, and then he methodically removed judges that were uh, hostile to him, and has created um, an autocracy. He then um, took a bold move that he knew would be popular, but t in total violation of the rule of law, which is he instructed his police and military to start sweeping people up who were parts, a part of gangs. Gangs that had caused a huge amount of violence and death there uh, in El Salvador. But he did it in a way with no uh, care in the world for the rule of law. So he has swept up over 70,000 people into, into jail. He's built the biggest, second biggest prison in the world, the biggest one in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and tens of thousands of the people in jail are innocent. So, um, and in the midst of that, he got the idea he would like to start to mine again. And he knew he had the supermajority in the legislature to do that. So our friends again got out and started to protest. They started to point this out. And that's why on 
Almost exactly 11 months ago, he arrested five of their leaders. We, of course, jumped back into action. And again, I, I'm looking at several of you who joined us right after the arrest. So January 2023, it tends to be a little bit cold. And out there in the cold, one of you brought a hand. <laughs> They'd just been arrested, uh, a handmade sign that said, Free Antonio Pacheco. And over the past 11 months, you have joined us in protests at the Salvadoran embassy, in petitions. You helped us with a congressional letter that Jamie Raskin signed that calls for, called for the release of them. You uh, helped us celebrate when all this pressure, and again, you, if you ever think international work isn't effective, it, it was that that created enough pressure on the Bukele government that they released the five into house arrests. There's still, the charges are there. And then we sent a delegation down last month. And my, I will say, spending time, many of you know, or some of you know Antonio Pacheco, but to see this man who would have died if he'd stayed in jail longer, the, the prison conditions are horrible. Deeply grateful for the international solidarity. He, we showed him the photos of, that you're seeing of the, of the protests outside. That's the second photo deck, if you, if you haven't put that up. But that's, that's where we are inviting you to come on, uh, on January 10th at 4 p.m. And Ross and the rest of us can give you more information. Um, by the way, the book is for sale for $20 over there and Ross and will be over there selling them after the event and online, go to your favorite bookseller. But I just wanna, I wanna end with a final word here just of conclusion um, of what Robin and I wanna leave you with today, which is just to remind you something that was so much in the words of, of, of both uh, Emily and Peggy, but which is that each of you are potentially or actually incredibly powerful actors for equity and social justice and environmental justice. And you can do this in so many ways. We're talking about just one of them today, but you can do them obviously as a friend, helping people who've been wronged uh, through injustice, as a consumer and how you purchase things, as a worker and how you press in your workplace for worker rights and also an environmentally sensible workplace. Some of you have a bit of money. You, of course, can advance these goals through your role as an investor in, in ethical um, companies and ethical stocks. Um, but this conversation is about then stepping beyond your role as an individual. And I know many of you, I've been in local fights with many of you in, in Tacoma Park in Washington, D.C., so you can do it as a local citizen. Obviously, we will all be spending a huge amount of 2024 in our role as national citizens trying to save our democracy. But this work we're talking about here is honing in our muscles as global citizens. And I think this story is one that, that reminds us all that work is hard um, and there are setbacks along the way, um, but it is for us, and I think for many of you, been the most um, rewarding work of our lives in terms of new friends and new allies. And as this story demonstrates, it can also lead to major victories. So thank you again for your role and looking forward to seeing many of you on, on January 10th. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, to close, I wanna share a passage by Andre McKinley, from his book, For the Love of the Struggle. Andre was one of the key allies in this whole tale. Um, and these are his words. There are times in life when things come together. Forces galvanize, pieces fall into place, and processes take on a magical quality that makes you wonder when the dream will end. That's what it felt like on this magical day for those of us in the struggle against metallic mining in El Salvador. 
There are simply no words to adequately describe it. It was a moment more precious than gold. It gave hope to a people badly in need of success in a long history of failed struggles for change. In a few moments, we will have our community sharing. When you can write into the chat or share in person about what resonated with you in today's platform. While we listen to another wonderful piece of music from Lilo, you might prepare by reflecting on a personal experience or an activity at West that the platform brings to mind. Salí muy temprano para no despertarme, para que no llorar, para hacerlo más suave, para hacerlo mejor. Una mano en el pecho, la otra con el pañuelo, hilvanando los sueños sin pensar lo peor. Manuelito despierta y me dice mamita, ¿cuándo regresará? La respuesta no es fácil, la estrategia se rompe, se pavió la verdad. I didn't cross the border, my friend. The border crossed my land. Don't be afraid, mi hermano. This land is yours and mine. Pasaba los años, celebrando un cumpleaños, en la esquina de la mesa, y al fin regresé. Ya no había nada mío, no se habían ido, los desaparecidos, los que sueñan con él, los que vienen de amar, y que importa un carajo, si no saben leer. Ellos son mis hermanos. Puro y más sano, los que cortan café. I didn't cross the border, my friend. The border cross my land. Don't be afraid, be a man. This land is yours and mine. No me jodas, paisano. This land. Is yours and mine. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, now is the time when we add our own voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates with our personal experience. For our online participants, I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments if you're watching the recording later. If you're here in person, you can come to the microphone uh, here on the floor, share your brief comments so that others may also share. Um, well, I'm going to Check, oh, we got, yep. So Trish on Zoom is saying, thank you for sharing the light of your wonderful work now when the world seems so dark. Um, and we can come back to Zoom. Um, and uh, so for the folks in the hall, please begin by saying your name and if you'd like to share your pronouns um, and be sure to keep your comments brief, uh, perhaps mo no more than a minute or two so others have a chance to share. If you, yeah, you can. Come on up. Hi, my name is Carl. 
Uh, I know that it's hard to foresee the future, but I'm just curious what you think might happen uh, with this government in terms of uh, mining and how it might transpire in general. Hi, I'm Julie Drizzen, she, her. Um, it's great to see the turnout here today. Uh, I feel deeply connected to um, the people of El Rodeo, to the people here who have brought us to El Rodeo, which includes Peggy and Ross and Susan and Pam and Lola, who I traveled with and we met up with Lilo in El Rodeo when we were there. And um, I also feel a deep connection to the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, I founded Democracy Now! IPS was a regular you know, guest and one of my best friends has been writing for IPS for a number of years, John Pfeffer, and Saul Lando, the co-founder with Mark Raskin, was um, somebody beloved to me. I went to El Salvador once with the people that I mentioned. Both of my daughters went to El Rodeo. It's a physically and emotionally challenging and life transformative experience, um, making the connections with the very welcoming community there. It breaks my heart that, uh, that people from the ADES, the community group, have been through so much in order to protect their water. And water is especially important. Uh, for those of you who've been part of West for a long time, you've been at various platforms here where you've learned that part of the solidarity that the West community has in this long-term relationship has been precisely about water, about getting water filters to that community so their water would be drinkable. Ultimately, to getting water to, uh, to the pila, where people could take showers and, and do their laundry in a larger, clean place. And then to get water to their homes, which the people in that community built all of the, you know, the pipes to get the water there. And Wes has been an instrumental partner in service of that struggle for delivering clean water to every household in El Rodeo. So I always take more than two minutes because <laughs> I always have a lot to say. But finally, I just wanna say, for those of you who are new to Wes, the um, statement of purpose was something that we all worked on together. And um, it's very meaningful to me that the final line of that is that where love and justice cross all borders. And uh, that is very important to me as a humanist, and it's very important to me as, a, as someone who has been an activist before, and it's important to me as a parent, important to me as a member of this society, um, important to me um, spiritually, and I hope that it's also important to you. Yes, uh, I am Brother Khan. I also call myself a rebel rouser. So first of all, namaskar. Namaskar in India means I bow before the greatness of your souls to the scholars and to everyone who is present here. So I'm very happy my friend from El Salvador, Betty, has accompanied me today. Uh, I come from an area also where there is a gold mining going on by Barrick Gold. And there is a lot of human rights violations in that area. So when the investors were meeting in May, uh, an activist human rights defender, uh, you see he countered the CEO of Barrick Gold, Mark Bristow, about what his organization is doing there. 
and Bristow told him, go back to Baluchistan. So very racist remark. So I hope, I'm so glad that you guys, I find West, I call West my spiritual home, but since I live very far away in Maryland, I can't come here regularly, but I will really appreciate if you may look at what Barrick Gold is doing in Baluchistan. Hi, my name is Lola Skolnick, and um, first of all, I want to thank um, Robin and John for an absolutely wonderful um, talk this morning and for all the wonderful work that you have done. Um, I know that uh, many people may not know the history of Wes's involvement in El Rodeo, um, but if you go to the um, Washington Ethical Society webpage and go to Global Connections, there should be links there to lots of stories about, from past platforms that have been done and um, some links to the people in the community actually chopping up the rock to, and, and as part of the big water project that, that went on there. Um, there was a lot of uh, physical labor that was really difficult and they they that just their commitment was so astonishing to that whole process um i will tell you that robin and john's book the water defenders is fabulous and i recommend that you read it or listen to it it's also available in audiobook which was really a fun um listen and lastly, I wanted to just mention that Julie Farrar did the um, artwork that's on the poster that you see of the, um, you, if you look at it, it's actually people whose lives were given um, to the fight against the gold mining. And it is a work of art that she created in their memory. So uh, I just wanted to give her credit and thank you all. I'm Josh uh, he him. Um, I'm here in tremendous gratitude for everybody who made today's um, um, service possible. I, I don't know if it was the rain softened me up, but everything has really penetrated me so much today. Even even the chimes like got really deep today and and it was just just tremendous. And, and um, in, in your talk, I was reminded of um, Michael Brooks, who left us much too early in his view of cosmopolitan socialism and how um, that's that's really the the only solidarity that that we can find that would that would really be lasting um, and and um, that was just just tremendous today and 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 um, and just just amazing and, and I'm in uh, just tremendous gratitude for for this community I came here the first time because I wanted to improve myself but I come here again and again because I want to improve the world and um, and Wes is one of the best vessels that I found for that. Thank you all. Hi, I'm Ross. I'll be very brief. Uh, John and Robin, thank you so much, and Peggy as well. But John and Robin, for all the work that you've done for El Salvador, the Philippines, IPS, through AU, through all your work. Just thank you for that. And for centering Wes in this probably way more than they should have, but it was kind of nice to hear that. I will say one thing, when we were on this delegation, John and I were on it, just about nine of us, some from Canada, some from here. We we're all supporters who meet on Zoom every Monday and do this work. What, what are we going to do next for this and that? And so when we were going to go in October, originally the, the Allies were, I mean, the Santa Marta Five were still in prison. And we didn't know if we'd be going to the prison. It was going to unfold with our friends in El Salvador as it was going to unfold. But then they were released um, under house arrest, which was amazing. And things shifted and it became more of a fact-finding trip. So we met with lots of people from trade unions, uh, students, lawyers that are defending people that have been unjustly arrested. And it was a, a very illuminating trip. Um, things were a lot worse than we had expected. And we learned an awful lot. And there will be a report coming, which we'll share with Wes and ask Wes to endorse, hopefully as a, as a signer, onto it. But uh, 
The final thing is read the book. These are hardbound editions. It's a great read. And also try to come on the 10th, as they've said. This is the, uh, these are the Santa Marta Five. This is Antonio Pacheco. We met with him for 12 years every time we've gone to El Salvador. Amazing person. And there's no way that these people should be in jail on trumped up charges. So come join us. It'll be really cold and nasty. You'll, you'll get to hold one of these signs and maybe take one home. So please join us when you can. It's the, it's the 10th, uh, 1416 Street, the Salvadoran Embassy. Thank you all. Four o'clock. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure we get to two uh, comments that came up on Zoom uh, while people were talking, and then uh, did you want to answer that first question? For, for 30 seconds. Okay, so um, so Patty says, what an incredible platform weaving together all the um, elements in, uh, in, in the end it's about wonder, uh, sorry. In the end, it's about wonderful West members who work so hard. We must keep it going. Um, and then Laura Steele puts in, so illuminating. Thank you for your work and dedication to such an important and life-saving cause. And thank you to all of our West people who have been working in El Salvador for so many years. Super, yeah. Um, Ross answered part of this. So the goal yeah, of the January 10th protest is they're under house arrest, but the charges are still there against them. And what Antonio and others told us in October is we've got a window of about two more months now where Bukele has pressure on him to do a few good things. He is up for, he, he is illegally up for re-election on February 4th. He's, he's jiggered the constitution a bit. You're only supposed to be a president once. He's about to be reelected for a second five years. So we have a window to put pressure on him to try to drop the case. And that's the goal of the January 10th, 4 p.m., 1416. It's 16th and P. Uh, so please do join us if you can. And again, thank you for the beautiful comments just now as well. So just as we share our perspectives uh, in this community, so too do we share our resources and gifts. Here at West, we split all undesignated gifts in the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. During the month of December, we are pleased to support the Worthy Now Prison Ministry Program of the Church of the Larger Fellowship. It recognizes the worth and dignity of incarcerated people by providing them with needed resources, such as educational materials, a pen pal program, and pastoral care. So you can learn more at worthynow.org. Let's all take a moment to prepare to respond to the invitation to generosity as we are able to donate online through the simple give system, text an amount to 202-335-1885, go to tiny.cc slash westgives or click on give on our website, ethicalsociety.org. And to donate in person today, you can place cash or check in that basket in the back of the hall on your way out, and you can always send a check by mail. So thank you for your generosity. We'll now uh, receive your gifts and the gift of music. The next song is more happy. Uh, and it's in, in, in Nahuatl. That's the language that people spoke. You know, and it's still some groups, young people fighting to keep. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because I learned this song from a, a friend. She was a Peace Corps uh, in El Salvador in 1977. I came in 1981. In 1982, she gave me this tape. It was selling by the by, by the Smithsonian. And it was this uh, a North American in 1930 something in Isalco. And they, re they have a, a record machine and they record this song. And it's basically, uh, it's called Cancalahuitunal. That is when the sun rise, you know, uh, my heart cries, something like that. So it's a very, it's a lovely song. <laughs> Let's go, 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 let's go
Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to the many people who helped create this morning's time together. Today's platform speakers, um, John and Robin, our guest musician, Lilo, uh, senior leader, Casey Slack, and staff members, Indara Miles, Robin Kravitz, and Maceo Thomas. And of course, our platform production volunteers, the tech, mem tech team members, slide artists, Zoom chat usher, and in-person greeters. Uh, so I want to share a few things uh, coming up in the community of ours. Um, so do not be intimidated by the term leadership in the title of the LLDC's virtual presentation tomorrow, Monday, December 11 at 7 p.m. Come join the Lay Leadership Development Committee for a discussion-based virtual workshop called Cultivating Ethical Leadership, where we will explore ethical leadership qualities that we may already have and how we can expand our own capacity to lead. RSVP on the West Facebook page or use the sign up link included in this week's emails. Also, tomorrow, um, December 11th, is the very last day to deliver your gifts for the Giving Tree. If you did not bring yours uh, today, you can deliver it to Genevieve Support. Genevieve is here today if you have questions on where that is. She's right, right there in the back. Um, and thank you to everyone who has participated in that program. Uh, make sure to save the date for the Winter Festival on Sunday, December 17th. So that's next week. We'll be enjoying an original play celebrating the themes of Winter Festival and music from our West Chorus. Join us at the normal platform time of 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Um, our next Wednesday at West will be December 20th. So things will kick off with spaghetti and salad dinner at 5.30, followed by a roundtable discussion of December's book of the month, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. There will also be a meeting of the West Writing Group at 7, a financial liter uh, literacy class with kids and youth at 7.15, and the West Chorus rehearsal at 7.30. It's pretty busy Wednesday. Fun for everyone. Um, and then it is hard to believe that the next year is only a few weeks away, but mark your calendars for the next sessions in our adult education series. The lifelong learning team continues their future planning series with a session on healthcare planning that will be held on Monday, January 8th at 7 p.m. over Zoom. And the Community Relations Committee's Creating a Caring Culture will be held after platform on Sunday, January 28th and that's here physically uh, in the building. You can register via the link in news and notes and be on the lookout as more sessions are added to the calendar. That, yep, that's it for announcements today. Um, as always, you can find information about opportunities to connect in the weekly news and notes email on the calendar page of uh, Wes's website, ethicalsociety.org. Uh, and again, if you are new to our community, please introduce yourself in person um, and complete a pink visitor welcome form from the front table or online via tiny.cc slash West Connects or an email at uh, Wes at ethicalsociety.org. And on the front table, there also are some blue West Cares sheets to inform Casey, the pastoral care team and or the whole community um, about joys, concerns, sorrows, and the corresponding form it, to that uh, physical one is tiny.cc slash West Care. So the pink and the blue forms can be added to the basket in the back of the room. Um, 
And uh, at the conclusion of the platform, please join us for social hour. If you're physically here, we'll be in the lobby, um, hanging out with the tea and coffee that luckily our volunteers provide for us. Um, and if you're on Zoom, you can head over to tiny.cc slash West Coffee Hour to join folks online. So I now invite you to join um, in our closing sing-along, uh, Clouds by Peter Jones, and then um, our closing words. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Robin and IPS. Muchas gracias. Thank you for your work with Chile, you know, El Salvador. I heard the Philippines for justice, you know. So thank you. And the Washington Ethical Society, thank you very much. The, the Peggy and, you know, 13 years, 10 years ago, we went to El Rodeo. You know, and, and, and you were there. You know, it's amazing how it's a small world. And that was so beautiful. I was invited by, by, this, by this guy, you know, Ron Carver. Uh, Ron, uh, he's been fighting, you know, for justice for so many years. And, and thanks to him, I met uh, people from uh, Vietnam Veteran for Peace. And I went to Vietnam this year, and also Washington Ethical Society let us use this beautiful space when Ron Heverly, he was the photographer who took the picture of the Milai massacre. And I have the honor to work with him, you know, and even he inspired me. I, I, I'm writing a song, still in progress, and the name is From Isalco to Milai. And one of the verses at the end, it says, From El Mozote to Quang Nai. Tomorrow is the anniversary when they kill a thousand people at El Mozote in El Salvador, using the same technique that they use, you know, killing children, killing the you know, animal and the crop. So it's tomorrow. And so uh, thank you very much and for choosing this song. It's a beautiful song, and I want to acknowledge, uh, well, First, you know, working with this uh, Vietnam veteran, I went to, uh, like three years ago, to this event in front of the White House. And I was, uh, I, and Ron told me, well, Peter is coming. Uh, but I saw it was my friend, Peter John. But it was the other Peter, Peter Yearwood from the Peter, Paul, and Mary. And he was singing, uh, he was singing, this land is your land, right? This land is my land. And when he finished, I jumped. Esta tierra es tuya, esta tierra es mía, desde California hasta Nueva York, desde los bosques hasta los mares. Esta tierra es tuya y mía también. So, and that's why, you know, I just get and it's a great experience. Uh, but again, I love the sign, war is not the answer. Look what happened in Chile. Thousands of people killed, you know. Many artists, they left, and you see those murals here and in, in San Francisco, La Peña. So thank you for choosing this song, written by this great and humble guy. Peter John, can you stand up? Por favor. <laughs>
way. Listen, there is a sign language, right? Uh, there is, you cannot stop right? the cloud from forming. I think so. And you cannot stop the rain from falling. And you cannot stop the river from rushing to the sea. And you cannot stop the people fighting to be free, right? You know, this song is including one album for children. You know, and it's amazing. Because I used to work at, at Oyster, and they always ask me for the song, and that's why I include this song. Uh, you know, and I have three things to tell you. One, you know, uh, do you have time? Oh, okay. Yeah, yes, please. Well, you know, I do, I, I do birthday party because I teach children. So I went to this uh, in, in College Park. At three years old, I went to, and I played all the happy birthday too. And I was leaving, and Mama said, Mr. Lilo, do you play Cloud? I said, no. I said, why? He's three years old. That's his son. So I, I get my guitar, he gets his balloon guitar, his balloon guitar, you know, and he starts playing and singing the cloud. You cannot stop the cloud. Second one, like a month ago, they invite me, for, you know, I teach at, at, at TCS, Tacoma Children's School, and they invite me to do uh, something in solidarity with the Palestinian people. You know. And they, they were students, they say, oh, we went to the, to the, to the capital. And what happened? The police came, because, you know, they were, and, and they were very, and I came, and I started singing the song. And everybody, the, and after that, they told me, the police were so calm, the people were so calm when I played the song. And the last thing, when we were, when we were in Vietnam, we went to this, uh, uh, this university. I was not supposed to play. It was wrong heavily. This, this place is like 20 miles from, from Milai, where the massacre. And so and he was showing the picture and telling the story, you know, how he saw this kid walking and this soldier, you know, stop and shoot him. And everybody was, I was crying in the back. You know? And all the students, they were, also some of them were crying and so sad. So at the end of the session, I was not supposed to play. Ron told me, Lilo, get the guitar. And I start singing the song. Finish. We go out, and this kid came to me. He said, Lilo, thank you for singing the song. And he gave me a hug. And he said, can you sing it again? I, I said, yeah. And my guitar was in the car. Oh, by my guitar. No, I, I went to that. And they were supposed to go to another class or to have lunch, and we sang again. So let's do the sign language, and we finish, right? Ready? You remember, right? You see? You cannot stop the clock. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Um, and now our closing words. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment, honoring the worth and dignity of every person and exploring the mysteries of life and the universe in community. Thank you all for joining today's platform in person or remotely. We look forward to connecting with you again soon.